So hello everyone and thank you for dialing in. This webinar is uh, specifically directed. Um, the topic of course is uh, about BCM in the Arabic world. Uh, this entire session will be in English by and large. Um, so we do have quite a multinational audience and happy with that. Thank you. Um, like to introduce uh, our speaker for the day, Magdi Hana. Magdi is originally from Egypt, done a lot of work in various countries in the Middle East, spent a lot of time in the UAE, <clears throat> currently doing a project in Saudi. So I'd say he has a pretty good understanding of the nuances. And a key reason to have this session is to actually introduce Magdi to you. The reason being that along with the FQ model, one is it's three days. Uh, most of the courses in business country that you find are five days. In my view, five days is for someone uh, fairly inexperienced or going to be uh, a subject matter expert kind of profile. Uh, for most people who may not be full-time practicing core team BCM professionals, five days may be slightly on the higher side in terms of pulling out that time from your busy schedules and even in terms of the cost. So we are trying to fill what we believe is a market gap of a three-day course. A three-day would be adequate for an experienced prof professional to get more of an understanding and adequate for a course you're going from zero to specialist, then you would need a bit more. Um, so that's one gap that we're trying to fill. And critically, uh, of course, I think as many of you may know, uh, we do a lot of work in the Middle East. And I've always been concerned that we aren't able to do justice so far to what the Middle East really needs. One is in terms of the course duration. So which is why we offer now this course, uh, uh, number one. And importantly, uh, many times, and I have the same problem myself, I don't speak Arabic. Uh, we have a lot of Arabic participants. And I must admit that I would struggle to give them uh, the understanding in their native language. Uh, so this course actually that we are promoting through Magdi, which is going to be in mid-December, second, second half of December, is a course taught in English with an exam in English, but we are making it very clear that the target audience is Arabic speaking. And we are encouraging Magdi, of course, if the participants want, uh, if there is any participant who says, uh, who switches over to Arabic and prefers to have a conversation in Arabic to understand concepts better because maybe that's the language uh, we've grown up with and we understand better. Um, highly encouraged to do that. So if there are non-Arabic people who came in, they may slightly struggle a little bit. We just wanted to make that clear. Uh, so I think without wasting more time, um, thanks, Magdi. Uh, I'm going to quickly uh, send, turn it over to you and uh, We'll start with a short uh, Q&A mode is what we thought for this session. So uh, we've come up with a list of questions. At the same time, please send us your questions. So I'm going to be monitoring the chat line and uh, please do put in your questions in the chat line. So at an appropriate time, we can try and uh, pull those in. Uh, towards the end, maybe the last 10 minutes, if, if possible, we'll just open it out for other questions. So uh, feel free, try and get the most out of your time here. And with that, uh, thanks so much. And we'll start the session formally. Okay. <clears throat> um, so Mandi, um, specifically, I think from, from my point of view, uh, in this session, we are not going to cover basics. Uh, we are assuming that uh, people who come in have a decent understanding. And those who didn't, I think through the pandemic, got a pretty decent understanding of what business continuity is and why it's important. So we are trying a little bit to go to the next stage here. And my question would be to you, uh, how can an organization monitor effective implementation of business continuity? So appreciate your thoughts on that. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me today. So uh, the session, as uh, Draj mentioned, it will be a Q&A. Uh, so uh, during the presentation also, we have uh, four uh, poll questions. So we will shoot it uh, uh, in a timely manner. And uh, as he said, please shoot anything uh, you feel in mind around the topic uh, by chat and we'll be answering as, uh, uh, as possible. So uh, for the first question, when we talk about the same implementation effectiveness, of course, a lot of people will go to BIA, a lot of people will go to management uh, uh, 
commitment, uh, policy signing, distribution, and all. Uh, but really, we look for it from the end point. So what is the end product of DCM? It is a plan. So uh, looking at the plan, and we have created some checkpoint for you here. We can discuss it in a quick way. So uh, who really is the owner of the PCP? Uh, is it the PCP team or PCM team or the uh, uh, PCM uh, 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 champions or the, the point of contact or who? So from this point of view, so uh, it doesn't matter really if the manager of business unit is the owner, but the business should own the PCP. Should own the PCP, it means they are really feeling this is a document where they need uh, this is a document where they will go back as a only reference during crisis, uh, when they relocate, when uh, any incident hit, or so on. So if you don't feel that this is the case in your organization, that means, believe me, is something wrong. This is something to tackle uh, for PC implementation effectiveness or a TPI. So you can put it one of the TPI. And of course, if the business uh, on the PCP, you will, they will ask for regular update. They will come back to you and tell you, we discover that a new process has to be added. We discover there is a new resource has to be added, whatever is a human resource or systems or anything else. So this is another checkpoint. Are they asking for it or they will wait for your annual review and you go ask them, can you please update the PCP? Uh, and uh, like the asking to test the plan or again because you have a regular annual plan they will have to go and test it and you would feel are they hesitant to give you a good time to test it uh, or they will really they will want to test it uh, are they giving you a new ideas are they asking for modification enhancement a better way to do things uh, and so on. They ask for a training or no. Uh, and most important, most important, uh, some core business function, let us say banking or uh, manufacturing or transportation or airports or so on, they actually consider other plans. It is very, very important than the PCM, uh, like PCM, for example, sorry, like instant manager instant management, or if it is an IT company, they will tell you that the DR plan is the most important plan. So do you face kind of this stuff or not? So if you face any of these checkpoints, you will know that there is an issue. It has to be looked at. Of course, now we are not discussing how. We're discussing just checkpoint to know are you going on the right track or not. You might need to make a turn you know, um, in, in your implementation and start to introduce a new way. Uh, like incident management, for example. Incident management could be very, very, very successful in one of the organization, but uh, because of that, they doesn't consider any PCP. They said incident management can do everything for us. So what you will do then? What you will do then? Uh, how you convince them that PCM is another layer of incident management? If you talk about timing, it's the management for short time, BCM is for longer time, they sell you, we can run instant management for months if we want, and so on. So really, on this point, we just put, thought to put it, uh, to let you think about how things can go, or uh, how to check the, uh, are you going on the right time or not. Uh, because believe me, if it is these things is happen during an incident or during a real disaster, Nobody will look at the PCP. They will look at any other document you have. And then what about the effectiveness? What about if you have any certification? What is the use of that if the swap happened? Thanks, Dr. Well, uh, thanks, Madhvi. Uh, you just got a comment uh, from uh, Rohit. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, excellent checkpoint. So we are off to a good start. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Um, <laughs> and 
and i guess uh, what always drives me nuts is uh, when uh, you go to the business and they tell the bcb head tell me what to do uh, clearly that's an organization where uh, the business is not yet taken charge and uh, is is waiting so one of my customers in saudi actually laughs and says that uh, till we didn't have a business country department everyone managed due to sheer corporate governance but now we where we have a business country department now even the smallest issue is a bcp problem and no one will deal with it uh, till the bcp team does so even if a light bulb has to be replaced hey note but i think the issue is that uh, once people step up to the table and they've taken charge uh, then you can be more comfortable that it's truly embedded and uh, the implementation is all through within the organization uh, so thanks uh, uh, next question magdi is supply chain a uh, supply chain was a big problem during the pandemic i think most organizations experienced that and many of them that bounced back much faster then got stuck due to supplier outage supplier non delivery etc so how would you check on a robust implementation uh, from a supplier perspective so okay so uh, for supply chain definitely during the pandemic uh, supply chain role has been highlighted very much because you will find out the national and international uh, lockdown has been done and interruption of uh, transportation uh, in manufacturing and uh, producing the raw material and all has been interrupted so definitely i heard the uh, uh, phrase one of the experts said if you didn't learn during pandemic you will never learn so it is really uh, a true statement so let us uh, check before we, uh, we reply like how we can do it uh, let us check what happened in uh, supply chain as a strategy most of the organization look at minimum and maximum strategy where uh, they put a threshold when it's done we will look to order and of course sometimes the uh, order cycle uh, go to from a month to several months depend on on the kind of the material what they ask uh, so uh, most of these companies actually it should start change their strategy to safe stock so they will know that we have a safe stock for x number of months and definitely this will be based on their budget because safe stock means i will keep extra stock uh, to serve my company or organization for x number of months this of course comes with a cost uh, but definitely it's not a waste uh, because you uh, support your function your core function uh, your core business for this number of months because again based on the our experience with covid we know that the lockdown will go up to 3 months or 4 months so this is a good limit to have a safe stock so if you do a safe stock for 3 months or 4 months again based on the nature of your organization you will be able to sustain without extra orders coming in mind uh, of course uh, based on again organization nature it could have more than one strategy uh, maybe we can mix the minimum max strategy with the safe stock strategy and uh, based on that we can support our critical stock the stock so uh, the second point is do you monitor your critical stock availability or do you monitor critical stock availability impacts so my really uh, point here or advice that actually you look for the impact not the critical stock list why first of all if i look at the critical stock list uh, in some organization especially in manufacturing or transportation or so you will find more than 20000 item on the critical stock so uh, of course monitoring the critical stock availability i'm not saying this is you shouldn't do it you should do it but not for business continuity purpose it will be uh, for uh, your supply chain your warehouses uh, your uh, depot or 
whoever using that spare parts to be available for them not to stop producing. But the most important, if I have a critical stock availability issue, then I have to look at the impact of it. Uh, and believe me, most of the time, you will have a critical stock unavailability, but there is no whatsoever impact on the corporate KPIs, production KPIs, availability of uh, uh, your, uh, uh, let us say, main equipment, uh, main line of business, and so on. So what I'm saying here, you have to look always at the impact of the availability of those critical stock. If you always monitor only critical stock availability, you will find no one month or depend on the route of your uh, uh, monitoring uh, dashboard or KPI, you will find it always ready. Uh, so this will be scary. This will be scary to organization because if you have 20,000 items, definitely you will not have all of them safe stock all of them monitoring the minimum maximum together. Definitely, sometimes you will have a new state parts identified you never ordered before and now became uh, required. And it is critical because it is stopping uh, a line of production from one factory. So that's why you look as well as to the impact of those ones. And then you can take decision which one you have to bring. Uh, I should really don't worry about that piece of spare parts because really didn't impact my uh, production number, my production lines, or so ever. So please, if there is any question related to this, I like to hear. Okay, fair enough, uh, Magdi. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, and I guess your experience with uh, the current organization actually very well equips you to be clear on supplier resilience. Uh, I'm sure a huge number of suppliers and many of them meeting this characteristic that you just mentioned. Okay, super. Uh, sorry, uh, Diraj, feel, can we shoot one poll uh, before the uh, question? Poll question? Yes, please. Before please absolutely. Okay. absolutely. So yes. there is one poll question here, uh, mostly about the COVID. So please uh, take, take like uh, 30 seconds to reply. You can see the result, right? So the question was before COVID-19, did you have a pre-tested business continuity plan? And we have 81% yes, and we have 19% no, which is really uh, uh, a surprising one because I was thinking it will be around 50-50, but it is really good that we have almost 81% uh, ready or you have an advanced audience who's attending today so yes exactly exactly mm -hmm. but actually my my really question for the 20 percent what you are waiting for so i hope they already started because uh, COVID started like one and a half year now so i think they have a time to reconsider the thing okay so uh Marty, so, next question coming up um you've talked about a couple of issues and concerns certainly uh, how can one forecast potential risks that could cause the disruption and therefore cause a business country problem? Well, so this is really very important question. Uh, so a couple of checkpoints or a couple of questions uh, for everyone. Uh, do you face some risk and say this has happened before? Or did you say I wish I was prepared for that risk? So definitely, definitely most of the risk, uh, we put it on our risk register, our threat list, what have you. And then we start look at them, do mitigation, do acceptance strategy, uh, or other solution to uh, reduce, either to reduce the uh, impact of the risk or to eliminate the risk if possible. Uh, what we are talking actually from different angle here. So there is some risk. Uh, it happened in front of us and it's going to happen and we don't see it. We don't see it because uh, maybe it come on uh, uh, far intervals, long intervals, yearly ones. So we don't look at it. And when it happened, we know that we could prevent the impact if we know that. 
let us have a couple of examples. Uh, the obvious one for IT. So if I have a system and this system failing every two months. So imagine if there is a disaster happened and you want to switch to DR and that system fail. So that system fail means uh, you could not maintain the RTO or RPO for that system because it is failed before or during the disaster fail over. So the point here, why I didn't record that interval. If I could record that interval, I will know that server will fail on that time. And then I can go to the root cause. Why is that? Then I will discover that the antivirus system is pushing the update. And that system, there is somehow it is hanged, so I have to restart. Something like that. Another good example. Uh, on a month, let us say, uh, rainy season, for example, in, uh, in UAE or Saudi or anywhere, uh, on rainy season, uh, like February, let us say, by February first week, there is a couple of people taking holiday. And then the next year is the same. And to happen that these two people is actually part of crisis uh, or incident response or recovery response team. So it happens that you have a crisis on that time and these two couldn't come to work. And when you look back, when you look back, you will find out that these two people is, are staying in a certain area which it will be flooded by rain and they cannot really come over because of some YD or uh, uh, accumulation of water happened and they prefer to be with their family in the park. So seeing that one and going back, I can find out from the HR system that this team always in the same time taking holiday. But I didn't look at it. I didn't find it. Why? Because I don't have that kind of capability or analysis uh, to look at it. I'm not saying here that you will have to look at every and each system and try to analyze. Of course, there is a system doing that. Or you can find a way uh, to uh, get out the pattern. We look at pattern here. So the way we should look at pattern from this kind of nature, which can have a major impact if it happened during crisis, because you don't, you don't know when crisis will hit. You don't know when your uh, HQ will become unavailable or anything. If we know, it will be easy. Uh, but risk, some risk, if we really try to analyze the pattern, we will come out with uh, a list or mitigation of those risks, and we will know that two people in that area, if it happened, then we have a backup for them, X, Y, Z, they will come or the system, or of course you can fix the system as an IT. And of course you can think in many, many patterns happened in front of us, but we don't really consider it or look at it because we didn't see the full pattern in front of us. So if you see a pattern, you will see the forecast, then you can have your mitigation ahead of time. We have another pool, we can uh, shoot it. Okay, I will launch it. So for those who already have uh, the 81% who have business continuity plan before, we'd like to see their answers on that one. Is the plan work perfectly or somehow it didn't work? Okay, great. So you can see the results now. Uh, this is actually uh, expected. So 60% the plan worked somehow. Of course, percentage could be 
anything, but at least it works. But there is, of course, they discover lots of things uh, based on the nature of the COVID and lockdown on supply chain and, and the availability of human resources, restriction of traveling, and all, all this happened. Uh, and of course, the uh, uh, unfortunate one, which is really got uh, hit by COVID. So, uh, based on that, you can see that uh, again, those team definitely looked back at their business plan and looked at the major points. Uh, Listen, then definitely they have uh, good collective action to identify that. But this show you that the plan, most of the plan in that case was not ready for this kind of crisis. So we can add now one more uh, scenario for our PCP. And that's an answer I think with, uh, which kind of sounds quite logical. Uh, most people had something, but it wasn't perfect. It wasn't kind of fully ready and good, good to go. So um, that, that sounds like a pretty decent answer. Right. Uh, next question, Magdi. Um, the critical determination that makes business continue different is the concept of time. So we do lots of things by common sense, but when it comes to business continuity, we kind of, uh, it's, it's totally built around the timeline for resumption. Um, so the question is, what would one organization do to try and figure out what is the correct RTO, uh, the correct target timeline that they want to um, try to resume by? All right, so we will look at, of course, some fact, definitely based on the business nature. So if you are working for a, a TV channel, you might see uh, RTO with seconds because uh, the broadcasting uh, or TV shouldn't get a black screen uh, for a certain point of time. This could be based on the uh, advertising um, contracts, what you have, or maybe you have a regulator from uh, Ministry of Information or, uh, or any responsible ministry of that kind of uh, media. Uh, so, and if you work in a museum, for example, I did work in, in a museum in UK, and our RTO was 10 years. So it could really be, uh, vary uh, as, a, as a nature of business, this definitely. This is actually, I use most of you know this, but this is just to uh, introduction to what we talk after, which is then what RTO I will choose. Uh, again, normally, uh, as most of you know, I will go to the uh, uh, minimum uh, or uh, the uh, un, not the most important service and try to put figures and the, the critical service, which is made with a core service and put a figure and then run uh, a trial and see if it is matching, then you can update them before you start. Like one of the uh, factory what I worked before, uh, they said the line of production of X uh, product is the most important. The RTO is, has to be the least. Then we discover later then having a stop uh, before readiness of that, you can you cannot run the product. So uh, again, it was dependency, so you have to run that before that. Uh, so RTO, of course, uh, some some schools let us say say this is the capability of what you can do now. Uh, so you put RTO on what really can recover. Uh, some other schools saying no, the RTO. Even if I cannot do it now, I will set up on something and I will try to achieve it. And then during the test, you can know if you can do it or not. Uh, the NTBT is, of course, a maximum allowed outage or uh, uh, maximum tolerant for uh, disruptive time. So uh, we can actually do it the maximum. So I, I always uh, make it as easy description, the RTO is the ideal time to recover and the versus the MTPD, which is the maximum time to recover. So the ideal and maximum. Uh, again, there is some school to say RTO should be fixed, like one, two, three, could be hours, could be day, could be second, or uh, the best practice as ISO, they say, no, make it ranges. So one to two, to three, 
less than one, more than X. So it will be really uh, much easier. Uh, definitely. So if it is one to two, which one to target? Normally we take the minimum. So if I say one to two, that means uh, my target is one. Two to three, my, tar my target is two, and so on. And again, it is much, much uh, based on the business nature. Okay, thank you, Magdi. And there is a chat question. So this is from Abdul Aziz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abdul Aziz. What's the difference between business continuity management and supply chain resilience? Uh, supply chain is a part of PCM, is a part of PCM. So you can actually think in a PCM, it's a big umbrella, which one of the pillars is supply chain resilience. Of course, there is supply chain, there is information security, ITDR, incident management, crisis management. This is all pillars under the umbrella of PCM. Okay, a um, couple of other questions uh, from Mr. Khalid Mohammed. <laughs> Interesting one. Uh, do you think we are going to reach perfection given that we are kind of uh, improving and, and getting into the uh, changing situation day by day? Nobody will be reach perfection. Otherwise, what is the enjoyment? <laughs> Enjoy the, the way to... Uh, to the hope, not reaching the hope. But let me tell you something. Uh, now for your car insurance, you pay insurance for your car. Do you think one day will come where we'll tell you don't pay insurance because no accident will happen? No way, no way, of course. So this is exactly what happened. And if you think that your organization reach uh, a perfection in, in, in PCM coverage, what about new risk is coming? What about new pandemic in different way? Uh, disaster in, in, in different way? Like, uh, let, let me give you an example. Uh, I attend a seminar in, uh, uh, back in 90s in, in, uh, in Dubai. They were talking about the uh, earthquakes and uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai and, that, uh, and Doha, it is an actually on a line of earthquake. On that time, nobody looked at that. After almost 10 years, the earthquake start to hit Dubai and Abu Dhabi. What happened? They start building uh, a national center for earthquake. See, this is the point. So all we think new will happen. So you maybe, I can say, your perfect level is reaching to a way to cope with new disasters. How I can form myself and be ready for any new disaster. Maybe this kind of perfection could be, but you cannot say I am covered now. And my view, Magdi, is that the definition of perfection will change. Uh, what's perfect today may not be perfect tomorrow. We come up with a new benchmark. So we are forever chasing that new mirage, but, but that's good. That means constantly we are improving. Okay. Yeah, see the ISO itself. It was no ISO then 2012, now 2019. And of course, next year maybe we'll have 20 or 21. <laughs> exactly. A different line of questioning. Um, as you said uh, yourself, uh, we prepare documentation, but where's the guarantee that we'll use the documentation in real life? In fact, that's the challenge that we have done all the nice work, but we still go from the heart as we've always done. Um, so let's talk for a minute about uh, what it takes to, to actually perform those roles and the human characteristics. And you've done some work in that area. So um, given the fact that it's human beings taking decisions, making decisions, communicating those decisions, tracking, monitoring, uh, how does the human angle play out in the performance of effective business continuity? So human resource in PCM, let us again look at some factors. Uh, human resource nature behavior. Uh, if we take a, a moment to talk about that, uh, definitely also this is a, again kind of introduction for the topic. Uh, when you choose your team for a recovery plan, 
or the instant recovery plan. So you have your technical evaluation uh, or technical, uh, let us say, list checklist, and you will have your behavior checklist. Uh, if I know that uh, X person is very good in his topic, and I will choose him because of his technical. But from the nature, as a human, you have to ask him, do you have like a panic attack? Do you have a problem when you see blood? Do you have a problem if you see fire and, and smell smoke? Do you have asthma? Do you have things like that? So what I mean, based on these, you really choose him not only because technical. So technical plus his competences, other competences, be it natural uh, for, for the situation of disaster, because of course, if there is a fire, we know that a lot of people panic, a lot of people can run, a lot of people can slow down, a lot of people can just stay still, freeze. So uh, from human, we have to really choose the right combination. Uh, definitely also, I will not ignore the uh, soft skill. So, is this team have the right language to speak to each other? Uh, are they okay with each other? And and and. So, it's become from this level. We'll go to the second level. When you really uh, go for disaster, okay. Normally, when I have a team of ten, uh, I will say the uh, proper equation. Uh, or, or, or the good equation to choose your uh, recovery team, it should be like uh, 15 to 20 percent. So you, from the 10, you will choose two, and then you will put one as backup. So the two, and the point is, instead of 100 percent uh, level of uh, delivery of that service, I will choose during disaster to do 20 percent or more, maybe 35 percent. Let us say 20% for easy calculation. So during disaster, I believe that we, if we give 20% performance of that service will be enough. That's why two is enough, correct? So 10, 20% is two. But what actually happening, what happening in real life, that even the normal uh, human, which have the capability to see fire, to see, uh, other incident can still perform without panic. But the latest study said anybody during disaster, he will give a maximum 60 to 70 percent of his normal uh, efforts and uh, thinking and concentration. If you take that percentages and reapply on the two we choose from the 10, that means if I get 60 into two means 1.2 to 1.4. So that means I will be able to deliver only 14, 12 to 14 percent of my service and my target was 20 actually. So if I apply this equation, I have to choose in that case three, not two plus one as a backup. Why? Because from three, again, I will go to uh, 60 percent so 1.8 to 2.1 so i am reaching my 20 percent so uh, 18 18 to 21 percent so i am reaching my 20 percent of the service level what i have to deliver during disaster uh, this is one part the other part which is actually important very important during the testing or exercise how long do you run the exercise for I can run the exercise for a few hours. So, or maybe in a very good term, I will run it for a day. So the, the next question, do you think repetitive process of that uh, uh, recovery process, it will still do in the 20% every day? No, normally this will not happen. So if I run the test exercise, assume I can run it for a month, I will find out that in 30 days, I am not getting the 20%, it is going down. It is going down. Why? Because there is other dependencies, you don't run it during the test. When you do the test, you don't, you don't do a full test, moving everyone to your alternate location, 
moving the DR to database or data center to DR and start to run a full crisis one. And if you do so, you run it for one day, but you will not run it for 30 days. Otherwise, you will disturb your original uh, business. So what is, the, what is the solution here? The solution actually, it is from that day of the disaster or the crisis uh, simulation, what you did, you will get some reading of the process. So that process, that part of the process take X minute, number of resources, and then you will run a simulation on a software to run that process for 30 days. Of course, this can be run in, in two minutes on a simulation process, and you will see the result. And based on that, what you can do, one, you can uh, add extra human resources, or if it is not possible, you can renegotiate with the management that uh, service delivery, what you will do. Do you want to do it on the 20% or can we accept 18 or 15% due to the fact one to three? Or maybe if you depend on an ERP system or what have you, what have you, it could be change, uh, alter the uh, process, uh, make less steps for approvals instead of four steps. Uh, make it three, make one manager approve two, three cents instead of one by one, many things can do that. So uh, to recap here, uh, you have to consider the 60 to 70% of the efforts for uh, human during the crisis. Number two, you have to reconsider the repetition of the uh, recovery process over and over to cover the 30 days and see what is the output you expect out of it. Okay, thanks, Magdi. There is another question, uh, two questions, in fact. Quick one from uh, Asgar. Um, uh, if you can keep it short, because there's another long one coming up after this. Uh, okay. What's the ideal testing frequency of a business continuity plan? Uh, again, by nature of the business. So uh, ideally once per year per plan. Very short. That was short. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. And, and a long question coming up from Sajesh. What's your opinion whether the BCM team to be involved immediately during a high severity op operation or an incident or the BCM team wait for a threshold duration for them to assess damage and then invoke BCP after the approval of the crisis management team? So do they jump in right away or do they wait for some sort of damage assessment and uh, uh, instruction from the crisis management team. Okay, uh, let us look first at the process. What is the activation criteria? Because normally, normally on the incident, the first incident hit, the first will jump in the incident management team. Whatever it is IT, whatever it is fire, health and safety, whatever it is core business incident management. So this is, has to come first in the picture. And then they will try to solve it. Maybe it will be solved in an hour and done. So you don't have really to activate in the same. This is one. Number two, if, if they find out that there is a long time of disruption, so they have to file a report, initial report, of course, in quick way to the crisis management. And then crisis management will judge because sometimes what will happen if there is a small fire? So small fire or, or a wing have fire or a floor have fire. Uh, so the result could be two. One, maybe the fire will be contained in a few hours or a day. So instead of management say, let us uh, activate the recovery plan and move to alternate location for a week, maybe they will say, just go home and come after tomorrow to office and everything run on normal. So definitely I have to wait for the uh, crisis management and I have to look at my activation process uh, if you want shorten it or something. The only thing, if there is uh, a disruption for a long time, I shouldn't exceed the minimum RTO for my interruption service. And this, of course, is considered by the crisis management team, where the business continuity um, head or whoever is a part of the crisis management team and is aware of all the RTO required from him. Okay, thank you, Magdi. Uh, question from Mark Fennec. 
I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Mark. And if I'm not wrong, you yourself are an author and quite a guru in your own field. Um, so the question from Mark is, can we consider risk-based testing? Uh, example, once every year for critical infrastructure, maybe once every two to three years for others. So can we kind of um, span it out based on risk levels rather than maybe a standard answer timeline for everything? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, risk-based testing, it is actually, it will be equal to scenario testing because actually scenario is based on risk. This is the point. So uh, again, if you say I need to test uh, like the infrastructure, uh, the less uh, important every three years or two years, definitely it is, is, there is no yes or no question. It is again based on the nature of the business. I might do that like for a bridge, uh, like uh, if you want to test the load on a bridge, you cannot do it once per year. You cannot do it uh, uh, once per month. So of course you need a longer time, uh, unless of course there is a crack, so that there is uh, anything from the uh, testing uh, ultrasound system, there is there some um, kind of cracks or anything. So in normal case, of course, definitely yes, you can really do uh, something like this every long time. And then def uh, also the incident management normally based more on the risk based. The, so that's why the incident, they tell you, we do incident management every day, so you don't have to test everything. But you will find some parts of incident management didn't happen for a year. So you really have to test. Okay, so um, a different question, uh, Magdi, not necessarily from the domain, but uh, what excites you about uh, the future of business continuity in the Middle East? Uh, actually, what I'm happy about the uh, most of the government in the Middle East realize the importance of PCM. So you'll find in SEMA in Qatar, uh, sorry, in SEMA in Oman, uh, SAMA in, uh, in Saudi for the central bank, all financial, and there will be coming soon another guidelines for uh, from Ministry of uh, Transport. And in Qatar also have their own standard. So this is what I'm really happy about, it's the uh, awareness uh, and the regulation pushed by the government itself to everyone else. So that means uh, the PCM uh, function will be activated not only because the company like to have PCM, but it will come really as regulation and they have to do. Uh, also, what I really uh, happy about that in Saudi, uh, uh, insurance company start to ask if you have risk management and BCM in place. So if you are doing so, they really do uh, decrease the insurance capital, the premium, what you are paying every year. So this is really a good sign because it has happened in UK since long time, and I'm sure in the US as well and other countries, but in the uh, in, in Middle East, uh, this is really first time I hear that the impact of PCM and the risk management already in place and other companies like insurance, I can even make now, like all, always when we tell someone uh, do PCM, he, he will say how much I will save. This is the first question. We will talk about is not saving, it is the image, it is uh, your continuity, it is uh, uh, your ranking in the market, like that, like that, but will not be really convincing as the amount if you save from other entity. That's interesting because it's good to know that this is happening on the ground. Yep. Um, in yep. the Middle East, I've always seen it as a theoretical concept and I see it's possible but it's crossed the possibility stage. It sounds as if it's really happening. Uh, and that's nice to see. Okay. Um, okay. Question from Joseph. Uh, I may answer this, uh, uh, Magdi. Um, sure. Question is, what tools do you recommend for use of business continuity, DRP, risk assessment, operational readiness? Uh, the quick answer, Joseph, is a very long list um, that honestly we can't do justice to on something like this. Uh, there are enough operationally uh, in deployed within the Middle East and deployed globally. So there's quite a, a large selection. 
uh, depends specifically if you're looking at, at business counting automation, uh, then quite a few who are represented in uh, the Middle East itself. Um, the other aspect that you haven't specifically covered here, but you may have implied is notification. So just being able to send out mass messages in multiple formats uh, to thousands of people in the matter of minutes and critically being able to get a response back very quickly. So you know that these are the 5% where there's a potential issue that you need to concentrate on and for the others, they've got the message. Uh, so everyone knows, so it gives you a report. Some tools also are plugging you into latest crisis information from various websites. So using artificial intelligence, trying to quickly understand the parameters that are affecting your markets, your products, your industry, uh, so that you're getting real-time information, uh, which you can then use uh, to your benefit. So honestly, it's a very wide answer. Uh, so not going into a detail here. If you can just drop us a message separately, um, get in touch with me and focused manner in which, uh, in terms of what you're looking for, perhaps we can come back to you with some good answers of things that people are using in the market and are working well. Um, seem to be quite a few more questions. So kind of, Magdi, you've got them excited. <laughs> great, great news, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, from Tamer, do you see the future of business country is active, active services design? That's a nice one. Uh, depend on the cost, right? I mean, the easiest thing I always say for PCM you have a building, have a 12 floor and 500 people. The easiest thing, build the same building and those 12 floor and hire another 500 there. This is active, active. Uh, so uh, again, business continuity is not only systems, right? The system is part of it. Uh, what about suppliers? What about human resources? What about assets? Uh, so like, for example, uh, as an airline uh, to have, uh, they have 400 European. So to have active actives, you have to have another 400 OP. If this work just moves this. So of course, it is not really uh, a right approach uh, from my point of view, because it will, it's not really cost effective. And most of the company will not run. If you talk about IT only, IT part of the business continuity, why not? If it is affordable. But again, uh, you go to a company and say there are the minimum or the most critical service with minimum RTO is four hours. So uh, why you have to make it active? If it is four hours, that means you have really uh, make it active passive, maybe maybe async, not sync uh, replication, async replication. So at least if you hit by a, a, a malicious uh, virus or whatever, whatever, it will not hit both at the same time because active active means what? send the message here, boom, replicate it on the other side immediately. So if you have a corruption here, both will be corruption. What about RPO? So in that case, you want to keep RPO as zero, but what is really the cost? So in cyber uh, attack, it's always to have bigger RPO. If you have one hour RPO, everybody will be happy. So at least I have one hour before replication, at least I know when I can recover from that point. Okay, thanks, Magdi. Uh, question from Muneeb. Uh, there are ISO standards for certifications for organizations. Uh, are they international certifications for people uh, to get their own professional qualification to be called a certified practitioner for business continuity? So I know the answer, but I'll pass it over to you. He is uh, looking at, uh, or she is looking at choosing BCP as a career. So kind of let me have you respond and maybe I can add my views after that. Sure. Uh, definitely, you have a mini certification actually based on your uh, standard. So you can have ISO. So in ISO, you have uh, the practitioner is called implementer. So you have lead implementer ISO 22301 lead implementer course where you can be named as lead implementer profession. And then also you have from uh, BCI, Business Continuity Institute. You can have certifications and affiliate with them. Then you can have, you be a member of uh, CBCM, MBCM. And you have also in American side, you have the DRII, which is actually uh, also have uh, lots of uh, levels of certification. So there is many actually you can do. Uh, but if you really want my advice, 
you start by lead implementer from ISO. Uh, and if you want to go to the audit, to be lead auditor also by ISO and take CPCI, which is actually uh, from PCI. From this, you will really have a good start to uh, excel in your profession. You can add your purpose. <laughs> Thanks. So I would say the key issue is how deep you want to go and how fast you want to go that deep. Um, sometimes it also becomes a, a bit of an um, kind of overload of knowledge at the same time. Um, that's some criticism that we get with the five-day course sometimes that there's too much all together, new terms, new terminology, uh, ways to do things. Um, so essentially, if you're looking to be a BCM uh, core team member uh, as a specialist, yes, I would think the five-day course does make sense. If you're looking to just get an understanding, you may not practice yet. Um, at least let's kind of get our feet wet. Let's uh, figure it out. Maybe uh, start a little bit getting involved and then grow into it and take a call. In which case, I think a three-day course should be good. So exactly like the course that you will be conducting in uh, December second half, Magdi. It's going to be three days. It's the key principles. Now, my view is that the building blocks are mostly the same. Um, it's how deep is the hole that you want to dig. Um, if it's awareness, I'm digging the hole very shallow. Um, could be four hours a day. Um, for senior management, it's even two hours. Uh, so we are not going very deep. We're keeping it at a high level. But the content may not change hugely. Uh, I go into a specialist, a kind of a, a practitioner level, a three days, we are going in much deeper. And here we are concentrating more on the doing part, not the framework so much. So uh, what a practitioner um, would need, say, a coordinator, the BIA, the risk assessment, plans, testing, exercising. Uh, that's what a coordinator needs to know because they are not necessarily developing the policy. They are not developing the framework documents. Yeah, they're using them. But if it comes to someone who's putting together the program, uh, that person is putting together the framework documents, et cetera. That's where you need the five day because you are developing the full skeleton. So I think um, um, the traditional option has always been the five day. And if you don't have five days, then maybe you don't do it at all. Um, so it, that gap remains. So I would say there are alternatives in between, uh, depending on how what level you want to reach, how much time you can spare for now. Um, are you sure it's going to be a career in which case go for the five day? If you just want to feel it through and see whether you like it or not and ease your way into it, then do a shorter course. And at the stage when you feel you're ready and uh, you're committed enough to make that investment of time and money, then maybe go ahead and do a longer course or the CBCI, which tend to be pretty expensive because the uh, fee itself is about 500, about yeah, 550 US for the CBCI, just the exam alone. Uh, the, the question, um, the, the whole course is a different issue. That's a different cost. And they just bumped up the cost, they increased the cost because they now said, if you are preparing for yourself on the exam, then you need to buy the BCI GPG also. Um, so that's added to the cost. So maybe about 600 US roughly uh, for the exam and anything else for the course. So again, uh, be sure that you want to make that investment and go for it or start small, uh, be comfortable, and then work your way up over a period of time. That would be my suggestion. Just going to see if there are any other questions and uh, perhaps not at this stage. So literally one minute to go. So I think we've timed it pretty well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Magdi. We still have 40 Thanks, people Sarah. on. So sounds as if everyone who came more or less stayed. Uh, thanks very much. And before we close, again, just to repeat that the intention was to introduce Magdi to you. He'll be running the three-day program for FQA in uh, December second half. Uh, that program will be targeted at Arabic-speaking individuals, as I mentioned. Like today, he'll teach in English. But if there are people who would want to switch into local language to understand it better, uh, we'd encourage him to do that. We don't think there's any program around in the market that does that. And given the fact that Arabic is the national language and the official language of communication in many of those countries, I think we owe it to them to do a program substantially in Arabic. Um, so it could be 100% English, depending on the audience, or if, this, if the audience wants, um, Magdi could stray into Arabic for key concepts. I think the critical 
point is that those who attend should come out with a clear understanding. And uh, that's what we're trying to achieve. So thanks very much. Uh, take care. Have a good day. And we'll wind up the session now. Thank you, Magdi. Thank you. Take Thank you. Thank you.